and verse 54. And along with what my wife was mentioning, that shipping project, we have one last book, a missionary book written about missionary journeys in Greece. And if anyone was able to give 100, we have one last book available. We do have more CDs, but that's our last book we have in us. And we'll give that to you as a gift. Genesis, Genesis chapter 24, verse 54, uh, the Bible says this. And they did eat and drink, he and the men that were with him, and tarried all night. And they rose up in the morning, and he said, Send me away unto my master. And her brother and her mother said, Let the damsel abide with us a few days, at the least ten. After that she shall go. And he said unto them, Hinder me not, saying, The Lord hath prospered my way. Send me away, that I may go to my master. And they said, We will call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. And they called Rebekah and said unto her, Wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. You may be seated here today. She said, I will go. And so in this particular portion of the Bible, uh, the text that I read to you, basically Abraham had reached an age in his life where he, he, he had up in years and his wife Sarah had passed away. And now Isaac, their son of promise, had reached the age where he was able to get married. And so the only problem was this. This young man didn't have a girlfriend. <laughs> and that's kind of a big problem when you're trying to get married. And so Abraham calls his eldest, most responsible servant for this very important task of finding a wife for Isaac. The servant comes near and he tells him, I want you to find a wife for my son Isaac. But he said, I don't want you to look from amongst the Canaanites. They were idol worshipers. But basically he said, I want you to go to my people and to my land and from there to pick a wife from Isaac. No doubt he wanted his son to have a wife that would follow him in serving the one true God. And so this servant goes on this far journey from Canaan, modern day Israel, all the way to Mesopotamia, our modern day southern Turkey, our northern Iraq between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. This servant goes on this journey without the help of certain tools that we, our family, relies upon to help us in our journey of deputation. And one of the uh, top tools that I rely upon is basically my phone because I punch the address to the church we'll be going to and I sync with my van outside and lo and behold in 2016 I have a van that speaks to me and gives me verbal directions all the way to the next city I'm going to go to. So I'm thankful in some respects for technology but I still know today and I know that I am in a Jesus name apostolic Pentecostal church and I know that we still know and believe that we serve a God who can lead us far greater than an iPhone. We serve a God whose spirit will lead us and guide us through life's ups and downs greater than any computer that this world could ever invent. How many know you today that if it were not for the leading and directing of God, we would have been in a dead end road somewhere along this journey of life. And so this servant goes and he has the blessing of Abraham. And Abraham said, the Lord's going to send his angel to prosper you and help you in the way. And so this servant eventually ends up at the well outside the city. And I could imagine it's hot because in that part of the world it gets very, very hot. And he stops there. And before he takes one step further, he realizes that he needs the help of God. God even more and so he probably look, lifts up his head to heaven and the Bible doesn't specifically say that but the Bible does record his next words and he begins to talk to God he says bring her to me Lord the one that I would ask of her water to drink and she would give water for me and then offer water for my camels and so really what the Bible is recording here today is what many of us know here today and that is prayer and what is prayer prayer is just simply 
talking to God from the depths of our heart with faith, knowing there's a God up in heaven that is hearing and that is able. I want to tell somebody here today, there might be a visitor or somebody that's just getting into this. You may hear others pray and say, I can never pray like that. But I've got news for you here today. If you can open up your mouth, if you can talk to God, if you can open up the depths of your heart, then that is called prayer. How many times have we been in the house of God and there may have been a drug addict or an alcoholic and all they could do was cry out to God. But there was a God that heard their cry, their prayer, and God stepped in the scene. And so here today, we all have that powerful tool at our fingertips. And you know, I, the Bible doesn't always answer in this fashion. But I love when it happens like this. But God doesn't always do this. But in the middle of that prayer, imagine that. You have your eyes closed and you, you're praying and you open up your eyes and you're half surprised to see the answer to prayer right in front of your face. Because brother, the Bible says that before he had finished talking to God, that Rebecca came walking up to him. He sees Rebecca. He asks water for, of her to drink. She gives it to him and then offers water for his camels. And so he's excited. He inquires and finds that she's of the family of Abraham. And so after that, he's probably saying yes, because he realized that God had brought the answer to prayer to him. And then he asks of her if there's room in her house for them to stay. And of course, we know coming from the Los Angeles area, what is wrong with this guy? You don't let somebody into your home unless you want to wake up with a gun to your head and somebody ready to rob you in the middle of the night. But in different parts of the world, and we have had the opportunity to live in the Middle East, we grew accustomed to their huge hospitality. In fact, I won't get into it all this morning, but we saw cultural parallels from Bible times that extend even till today. When we lived in Turkey and near the border of Syria, we would go there into the homes. And when you enter the home, you take off your shoes and they will present to you sandals or house shoes as a token of caring for the one of the most dirtiest parts of your body, your feet. Of course, in old Bible times, they wouldn't do that, but they would wash your feet and we saw these cultural parallels of hospitality caring for one of the dirtiest parts of your body extending till today so they go there into the home he's hungry there's food put on the table and before he eats one bite of food he says I got to tell you what I've come here for and his purpose was this he had come and he believed that their daughter was the bride whom he was seeking after now, I have two girls and they're out in Sunday school, but what would you do if somebody came knocking at your door and you looked out and there was some random guy that wanted to take your girl away for a wife? You probably have to go fetch the 12 gauge shotgun right there and say, yeah, I'm going to close my eyes and count to three. By the time I open up, you better be halfway down the block because when somebody comes knocking on my door, there's going to be a background check and a credit check. Can I get a witness? Every other type of check possible. <laughs> before they get my little one. But you know, it strikes me as a miracle because the Bible says that the dad and the brother say, what can we do? The thing proceeded from God. Because as they heard the sequence of events, they realized that God's handprints was upon this whole situation. And God was orchestrating this event. And does God have a plan? Yes, he has a plan. Did we come here by a coincidence? No. That's a lie from the, from the pits of hell. God has a distinct purpose and a plan and God has us in this church this morning for a reason. God has a plan for each and every one of our lives. But it's up to us to say, God, I'm going to step into that plan that you have for me. And so he, they release her as a bride. They say, what can we do? The thing proceedeth from God. And so the next morning is ready to get back and they kind of put a little bit of breaks in it. The mom and brother say, let her stay with us a few more days at the least 10 and then she shall go. And so the servant turns to them not liking that and he says, hinder me not seeing the Lord hath prospered my way. Send me away that it may go to my master. And they said, all right, let's call this young lady, Rebecca, and ask at her mouth. They called Rebecca 
forward and now this young lady finally had the opportunity to speak for her own future and marriage and they asked Rebecca will you go with this man and Rebecca stood there uh, with all these thoughts in her mind think about it if we were faced such a huge decision to make and if Rebecca said yes church she would be she would be leaving her family and her friends and her comfort zone and everything she had ever known and she didn't know if she would ever see them again if Rebecca said yes to this man she would be moving halfway across the world because that was her known world in that day and time before they had discovered regions beyond from Mesopotamia to Canaan was a long ways off in those days and I know that we are living in 2016 we can appreciate the fact that if Rebecca said yes she would be taking steps of faith that I don't know if I could have taken myself she would be married a man that she had never seen in her whole entire life you know if it were you and I we'd be googling their name trying to find a picture I've got to see what they look like before I marry them I would not marry my wife before I seen how beautiful she was but I've come to tell you today that despite all these uncertainties and question marks that I know that Rebecca faced in these things but she at the end of the day responded by faith and said I will go in essence I will go to where God is calling me to go and I will do what God is asking me to do and that's what it's all about responding to the call of God and saying God I'll do whatever you want me to do and I'll go wherever you want me to go and so that's what happened to us some years ago we moved to the country of Turkey and we lived there and I was talking to pastor a little bit beforehand and imagine we got to live in Antioch Turkey that's biblical Antioch the place where we were first called Christians and we would kind of stand there and the brother and I would say I wonder what Paul thought with this same viewpoint some 2,000 years ago we're standing here and just kind of relaxing with the same vantage point that Paul would have had biblical Antioch in Turkey but let me tell you that it was no longer a stronghold of Christianity but now Turkey is a place that was and is 99.8 percent Muslim an overwhelming majority pastor asked me and it was really true but uh, he uh, if, if my complexion helped then I said yes you know because God gave me a natural camouflage when I went there so I walked in there in the Middle East and they thought I was one of them <laughs> just kind of mixed in but you know what we were there and it was an underground work meaning we did not have the beautiful church that you have here today I'm sure you know it but you are, are blessed here today to have a church we're in a, a huge sign to freely advertise to the community we went there and it was an underground work a pioneer effort we had to have church in our homes from living room to living room closing the doors closing the windows rolling up towels to stifle the noise but yet in an underground setting I have discovered that God is still omnipresent he's not held back by government restrictions we serve a God we felt his presence even in the midst of an underground house church because where two or three are gathered together in my name there will I be in the midst of them my wife and I purposed in our hearts we said God we know we said God I will never sit in a church where the presence of God is flowing and feel embarrassed or ashamed to shout to lift up my voice to worship God with liberty because I know brothers and sisters that don't have the liberty and freedom to worship God today so I say God while I have a chance I'm going to rejoice with all all that is within me can somebody clap your hands unto the Lord here today you take for granted as a Christian many things that we have freely available to us until you see that it's not that way in every place in the world in that underground church setting they about a year and a half into it they had a leadership seminar and this leadership seminar basically they brought in international evangelist teachers to teach and it wasn't a holy ghost revival it wasn't a uh, crusade but it was a leadership seminar 
taught from apostolic principles, of course. And so they brought in an interpreter because at that point we had all arrived there for the first time really in that area. The missionaries we were helping had arrived one month in the city for the first time before us. So it was a learning experience. Uh, didn't know a single solitary contact or soul. Very few people spoke English. And so they came to this leadership seminar, some other denominational people from the community. And the, we needed to find an interpreter and we found one and he came. Except the only catch was this. This man was a Sunni Muslim. <laughs> What's wrong with you guys hiring a Muslim to be an interpreter at your Christian event? <laughs> well, sometimes when you're on the mission field, you got to work with what you got. And that was all that we had to work with. And this Muslim interpreter came to our event. And after three days of interpreting, I'll tell you what ha happened. I witnessed the miracle as did my wife. As this man, a Muslim man, which do not cry easily, stepped back. And you know what? He began to weep. He began to cry as he felt the presence of Jesus. And God began to tear down walls of tradition and false religion in his life. I'll never forget to the day I die as I walked up to Zeki and I asked him, do you want the Holy Ghost? He responded to me without hesitation, yes. And then he lifted up his hands to Jesus and as he began to repent, church, he was filled and it wasn't hours, it wasn't even minutes. It was a matter of moments before this Muslim man had been filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues because the Holy Ghost is real and God is still pouring out his spirit upon all flesh. If there's even one person here today that maybe hasn't been filled with the Holy Ghost or somebody that feels maybe just even a little distant from God and maybe you think I have circumstances in my life I've done too much this that or the other I want to tell you the devil is a liar if I have witnessed with my own two eyes as God has stretched forth his hand into the valley of the Middle East and filled a Muslim with the Holy Ghost how much more here this morning in America God has more four had received the Holy Ghost in that setting before it was all done in a leadership seminar including the local Methodist pastor's wife you know why because this Holy Ghost that pastor preaches about it is more than just for a certain label I don't care what your religious background is I don't care what upbringing you may have had but the Holy Ghost is God's gift available to all and so it was soon after that that the Lord redirected our steps to the country of Greece and we moved there to Greece and I love history that's my favorite subject and so I think about history but more greater than history is Bible history our history our apostolic book of Acts history and I think about the Apostle Paul was in uh, Troas which is modern-day Western Turkey and while he was there he had a vision of a man in Macedonia that said come over and help us at the leading of God's spirit the apostle Paul set foot and you know he made history by preaching for the first time ever what had never been heard up to that point in the continent of Europe and in the modern day country of Greeks when he preached to repent to be baptized in the name of Jesus and to be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost and now this message has been like a wildfire preachers and missionaries across the world proclaiming what has been preached every single week in this church I want to encourage you here tonight don't ever let the devil get on you and beat you up and say we're just part of a select few the devil's a liar we have people across this world that baptize in Jesus name that believe truth just like this church preaches it's not just a message that's limited to a select few but God's word is being proclaimed to the uttermost parts of the world and people are responding and so in ancient Greece Paul made his way to old Greece 
and made his way to a city called Neapolis in Acts 16. That same city exists, and we have been there, and it is now called Kavala in modern-day Greece. In that same city, we got brothers and sisters that are baptized in Jesus' name some 2,000 years later. From there, Paul went to Philippi, and we're standing at the river, the old city of Philippi there, and that's that same river, where Acts 16, where Paul met Lydia, a seller of purple, and her and her family were converted and baptized, no doubt, in the name of Jesus. And so, the, nearby there, there they have the ruins of Philippi, just right there. And uh, it was there in that old city of Philippi that their Bible says that there was a young damsel, a young lady that followed after them and cried, These men are servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. But this young girl was not speaking about of, of so much love and respect, but there was a demonic spirit spirit that held her captive and when you read the bible story you realize how powerful this stronghold of demonic possession was upon her because she was not laughed at and and just walking the streets like somebody that they just disregarded what the bible says that she made her masters much gain by soothsaying or fortune telling in other words this young lady was not struggling to pay the rent at little storefront but she held captive the attention of the masses by the demonic powers that were being manifested through her life until you know what happened there came along a man of God named Paul and the Bible says I like the way it says it it doesn't say that he asked or that he pleaded it doesn't say that he got down and said pretty please but the Bible says he commanded and no doubt with authority in the name of Jesus for the spirit to come out and it came out the very same hour aren't you glad here today that God has given us as Christians and we got the same Holy Ghost he has given us power he has given us authority over sickness and disease and demonic spirits I don't have to plead I don't have to beg but I can speak with authority we are sons and daughters of Jesus we are the church here today and we're that same church we're the continuance of the same church that Paul was a part of I remember we had just moved from Turkey to Greeks and we were there that first service and what happened was a week prior there had been a lady that had asked a prayer for her son and her son had been healed by the prayers of the church and so they came back the next week and that was our first week there and the elder, the other missionary was gone that week and he asked me to preach there at the church and I said all right and to be honest with you my main objective for that service was for everything just to go normal <laughs> because he wasn't there so I just wanted everything to go normal just a good normal report uh, everything well like a, like any other day well anyways the Lord saw differently and during that altar call that lady that her son had been healed the week prior they there was a stir and it became apparent that she was possessed by a demonic spirit and so during that altar call service I just tell you this because there's a praying it was a praying church and a powerful church before it was all said and done the demonic spirit spirit had went out and the spirit of God had come in the next week that lady came back with her husband and they dedicated that little boy to God they came back the next week and her and her husband were baptized in the name of Jesus and they came back the next week and her husband was filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost and they haven't stopped coming as far as I know because God is still able and God is still doing it today and you and I are the channels of God's anointing to touch this world and so Paul made his way to some old Bible places you may have heard of Thessalonica 
Thessalonica is in modern day Greece. In fact, so you don't forget us, I'll make it very easy. When the preacher's preaching and they have you turn to first or second Thessalonians, say a quick prayer for us. Because Thessalonica, there's even a United Pentecostal church in the old city of Thessalonica. Same exact town. And I think about all these Bible places like Berea where they received the word with all readiness of mind. And we have got to walk the streets there and see in the city center where they have a statue and a mosaic commemorating when Paul preached into the Bereans. Except we know what Paul really preached. He preached what is preached at this pulpit to repent, to be baptized in Jesus' name, and to be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. I feel like you're saying at this point right now that if you have burdens of sin upon your life, if you have burdens of shame upon your life, burdens of hurt, burdens of unforgiveness, I rebuke the enemy in the name of Jesus because there is a God, there is a gospel that is able to break the chains of sin and able to give you a brand new life if only you would be obedient to the gospel like Rebecca and like Rebecca say I will go God I'll go wherever you want me to go I think about old Greece Patmos John the Revelator where he, he was exiled as a modern day Greek island and of uh, Corinth we have got to go there to the old city of Corinth and walk in the same streets where Paul would have walked in to, when he preached unto the people of Corinth and the island of Crete where you can read about in the book of Titus uh, that old ancient island in years past there was a church but the missionary had to come back and deputation and that church was lost in that time but you know what in this last year and a half they have reopened a united Pentecostal church on the old biblical island of Crete because the gospel is going forth once again and really as we come here today we're just so delighted and happy and we just feel so honored but really we're nobody special we're just simple folk like you all but you know we're even though we're not great in and of ourselves I'll tell you what we go with the great message we go how many know you're today you may not be great in and of yourself but you have a great message you have a great testimony we have the gospel that can set a soul free <laughs> And finally, Paul in old ancient Greece made his way into the city of Athens, that old ancient city. And as he walked into the streets of Athens, the Bible says that his spirit was stirred in him when he seen the city wholly given to idolatry, as he seen the people that were given over to pagan religion and worship of Greek mythological gods. Gods. He saw the temple to Athena, the temple to Olympian Zeus. He saw all these temples. What he really saw were people that were given over to false doctrine. People that were following a way that could not get them to heaven. And so Paul was there and he began to dispute with them and tell them about Jesus. And they brought him to Mars Hill. And I'm standing on Mars Hill in this picture. And as I stood there on Mars Hill, I kind of closed my eyes until I felt my robe flapping in the wind. And then I opened up my eyes and I realized I wasn't the Apostle Paul. But it's good to imagine for just a second on Mars Hill. But Paul stood there on Mars Hill, and you know, he was facing a very intimidating crowd. Imagine facing the brightest minds of that day. Paul was also a bright mind, but he was far outnumbered that day. He looked at all these intimidated, intimidating intellectual men, so sophisticated and educated. And Paul, no doubt, would have looked up what you can see in the background, what is called the Acropolis. The second highest point in all of Athens, filled with temples, the false gods. Beautiful, grand edifices. You could still see the ruins, some of them more intact than others. But Paul would have saw it in its entirety. Beautiful. How could they have made them, I think, without modern day cranes and technology? But Paul saw these intimidating churches, false churches, if you will. And he saw this intimidating crowd. But church, I'm so glad that as Paul stood there, he didn't shrink in intimidation. He didn't say, oh, I'm just a poor one this pinnacle 
Pentecostal. But Paul stood there not with fear or favor, but with fire and fervor. And he said, ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and I beheld your devotions, he said, I saw an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. God. He said, whom you therefore ignorantly worship. He said, him declare I unto you. And he declared unto them the name that has been declared this whole service. Can somebody say it one more time? The name of Jesus. Can somebody with revelation, that is a name that we can be healed in. Jesus. The name that we are baptized in. Jesus. And I know I'm, I'm not going to take much longer, but I've got to share with you with, if I can put it, my buttons popping with sanctified pride that we have a United Pentecostal Church not less than three miles away from Mars Hill where Paul stood and preached that day. A church where people are still baptized in Jesus' name. A church where people are still filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. And there are people waiting for us to get back. There are literally souls that are waiting for us to get back. Why? Because of what we have and what we carry. This wonderful Jesus name gospel message. And I thank you so much. I thank God for pastors like yours for a vision of giving. And you know, pastor realizes that, uh, and it was been some years back, you probably remember, but I remember they said one year at the camp meeting that a church is not always measured by your seating capacity, but by your sending capacity. But you know, when you give, you'll be taking part in that sending process because you may not be able to go, but you'll help send somebody off to go that can and that God wants in that part of the world. And I thank God for a church like this. And church, you may be, meet people over there in heaven that you never met on this earth. But because you gave, because you prayed, they are going to be up there in heaven. Because you said, God, I have a vision beyond my own life, beyond my own thinking, God. I'm going to reach out to others, Lord God. Amen. I wonder if you could all stand with me here today. I want you to know here today that when God comes knocking upon the doors of your heart to say I when you say I will go I am not just trying to tell you here today this morning about going to the uh, foreign mission field because church I'm sure you know it but the foreign mission field is great but it's not the only mission field and I have discovered here today that the value of a soul is the same everywhere in the whole whole entire world there's souls that are valuable in this mission field in this vast area different ethnic groups people that are dying and going to a devil's hell unless somebody says God I will go Jesus I will go I wonder here today if somebody if all across this church if you could just kind of begin to just think about it a little while you know Jesus he was not forced to go to Calvary and so he was God manifest in flesh meaning he knew what lay ahead the pain the suffering the torment and as he walked into Jerusalem he didn't walk into it blindly but he knew what lay ahead and so as he was walking there to that cross he was not forced to do it he had his own will I believe that somewhere in and of himself he said I will go Hebrews 12 2 says looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God so as Jesus went there to that cross he knew the pain and he knew the suffering but he said brothers and sisters I will go because I see the joy that is set before me and what was that joy that was a joy of seeing somebody coming up out of the waters being baptized in Jesus name perhaps so God saw into the future into a moment and he said saw your face and mine and he said I will go right now 
right, as we're just, the spirit of the Lord is flowing. These altars are open. You know, I wonder here today, at first I'm going to ask this. I wonder if maybe there's some saints of God, faithful saints that have told the Lord many times, even in times past, I will go. But if you could tell the Lord again, I've told you a million times, God, but for the millionth the one time, Lord, I'll reaffirm it to you. God, I will go. I'll go to my workplace, God. I'll go to my family that's lost, Jesus. Lord God, I'll go. I'll stretch myself out. Come on here today. Jesus didn't hold back an ounce of his body, but he gave his all for you and I. If there's somebody here today, maybe that doesn't have the Holy Ghost, I want you to know that God can fill you with the Spirit. All you got to do is respond to God in humility and repentance. In essence, telling the Lord, I will go. Jesus, your Spirit is here today, Lord God. Your grace is here today, Lord God. Come on, Lord Jesus, we lift up our hands to you, Lord God. And we just pray and talk to the King of glory, Lord God. And tell you, Lord Jesus, we're willing to go. We're willing to do whatever you want us to do, Lord Jesus. Lord God, we're willing to take the steps to be in your perfect will today and in this life, Lord Jesus. Jesus is strong.